Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashley Tellis, a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to the endowment this afternoon to hear our very special guest, uh, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who has come back to Washington after another iteration in diplomatic service uh, in Afghanistan. I first encountered Ryan almost a decade ago and I don't think he even knew it. I had just finished uh, a stint in Delhi with Ambassador Bob Blackwell and was getting ready to return to Washington. And we decided as part of that transition that we would visit uh, Afghanistan, go to Kabul, because we were both coming to take jobs that would involve uh, some work uh, connected to Afghanistan. And so we went to the chancery for two or three days of extended meetings with the staff there in 2003. This was the old US chancery that had suffered terribly uh, during, the, uh, during the wars. And one day during uh, those two days of meetings, I walked to the ambassador's conference room. And in the ambassador's conference room was a series of photographs, photographs of all ambassadors, US ambassadors who had served in Afghanistan. Because they'd moved into the chancery so quickly, uh, the photographs were put up, but not necessarily the names of the ambassadors. And so I was just looking at that gallery of heroes and trying to make sense of who I could identify and who I couldn't. And just when I was doing that, Bob Blackwell came up behind me and put his finger on Ryan Crocker's photograph and said, forget about the rest. This is the all-star. He makes it to my A team. And I thought that was, you know, Bob being Bob. But when I came back to Delhi and actually decided to check Ryan out, I discovered very quickly that he had a long and illustrious career as America's premier specialist in the Middle East. And if you look at the places that he served, it's like a who's who of places that are important to American interests. Lebanon, Kuwait, Syria, Pakistan, and Iraq. I finally met him in person, actually, before he was going to Pakistan. And we spent a half day briefing him. And everything that happened in that half day, his wit, his acuity, his perception, his intelligence, everything comported to that description that Bob Blackwell had used several years ago when he first described Ryan Crocker to me. Ryan finished. Uh, in the last years of the Bush administration as our ambassador to Iraq, presided over a transition that was extraordinarily complex and difficult, and retired from the Foreign Service with the highest title of Korea ambassador, came back uh, to Texas and worked as the dean of the Bush School. And I think at that point, he was looking forward to a real transition and a life that would be his own. But fortunately for the United States, I'm not sure I'll say fortunately for him, uh, the president called again. And in very difficult moments, uh, President Obama asked him to come back to national service, which being the patriot that he is, he did. Uh, he left to the Bush School and went back to Afghanistan as America's ambassador in a moment when we were beginning yet another transition. And this afternoon, uh, we have been very blessed to have him come to Carnegie uh, to make this his first stop on his return from Afghanistan. And he'll speak to us about what the transition in that country holds, uh, what the prospects for success are, and why Afghanistan, after all is said and done, uh, still matters uh, to the United States. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to the man President Bush once called America's Lawrence of Arabia, <laughs> Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Ryan, thank you. Um, well, um, thank you, Ashley, I, I think. Um, um, Ashley notes that uh, 
before I went to Pakistan in 2004 as ambassador, he, he very generously um, spent much of a day with me um, to give me some perspectives on a part of the world uh, with which I uh, was not very familiar. Um, my career had lain uh, to, the, to the West, almost exclusively in the Arab world. Um, uh, Pakistan clearly was uh, a different phenomenon. Uh, and I've always been grateful to you, uh, Ashley, uh, for that. Um, I'm particularly grateful for the um, fact that because of the, the depth, uh, the range, and the acuity of your briefing, I can blame every single mistake I made uh, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan on you personally. So, uh, um, uh, the, the circumstances of the time require me to um, uh, begin on a somber note. Um, uh, my good friend and colleague and a friend of many of yours, uh, along with three of his colleagues, um, uh, recently returned from Libya to, to Andrews uh, after their assassination in, um, in Libya. Uh, Chris Stevens uh, was one of our best and our brightest. Um, we have a lot of great foreign service officers. Uh, we have very few who are equally adept at managing uh, the complexities of Washington as they are at managing the complexities of the region. And Chris was one of that, um, that very small tribe. Uh, like so many of us, I feel his loss. Um, uh, very deeply and, um, and personally. And it is a reminder that um, uh, diplomacy uh, in the hard parts of the world, and uh, those parts are growing regularly, um, is not about uh, pushing cookies and pinstripes. Um, it's about risking your lives and uh, the lives of those who, um, who ride with you on these missions. Um, uh, I was an ambassador six times, um, Lebanon, Kuwait, Syria, Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan. And in three of those six countries, half of them, a predecessor of mine was assassinated. Um, so. Again, I don't need to tell this audience, um, uh, but uh, your foreign service is, has been, and um, will continue to be very much not just on the front lines of diplomacy, but on the front lines of, uh, of conflict. Um, I was, uh, it was suggested to me that I talk a bit uh, this afternoon about the future of Afghanistan and U.S. interests. Um, Ashley, of course, in his um, um, uh, unique um, uh, and inimitable way, broadened that significantly. Um, uh, but it doesn't matter because I'm no longer in government service, so I'll just talk about whatever the hell I feel like talking about. <laughs> um, uh, 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 this um, will be a collection of reflections, um, and I do hope to um, uh, ensure there is ample time for questions since uh, as I look around, beginning in the front row and proceeding in every row back, uh, I realize there is uh, more expertise in this room on this subject than I could ever hope to bring to bear myself. So I um, am grateful for the opportunity, but I approach it with, uh, with uh, due modesty. Um, first, let me begin with uh, some perspective, which is something that we Americans are not overly brilliant at. Um, uh, we're all about today and tomorrow. Um, uh, that's the spirit that built this great country. Don't bore me with the past, you know. 
I'm here, I'm here to make America, uh, um, and if it takes longer than the day after tomorrow, I'm going to move on to something else. Um, uh, so we tend to lose track of how important history is elsewhere in the world and how it shapes uh, the present um, and informs the future. Um, uh, out in the region where I've spent my career, as William Faulkner famously said once, um, hell, you know, um, the past isn't history. The past isn't even past. Uh, and so it is in Afghanistan and uh, the region around it. Um, uh, our relations with Afghanistan uh, up until 1979 were uh, characterized by uh, uh, a kind of a, I wouldn't say benign neglect, um, because we were engaged USAID from the 1950s before there was a USAID, 0.4. Um, but our interactions uh, were limited, um, uh, really not just up until the end of World War II, where our interactions throughout the broader Middle East were uh, were quite limited. Uh, World War II and the um, uh, the birth of Israel, the uh, Cold War confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union in particular put us front and center uh, certainly in Iran and the Arab states. Um, that didn't really carry over to Afghanistan. Um, um, in spite of uh, its poverty and some of its hardships. It was it's a nice assignment, not too much going on. Um, it began to change a bit uh, after the fall of the king in the early 70s. Uh, it uh, changed rather significantly more with the uh, ascendancy of the communists, and of course it changed dramatically with the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Um, uh, then we noticed. And as someone who has practiced in the foreign policy arena for, for decades, um, I just would remind you that when administrations face complex situations, um, uh, they um, come not as single sorrows, but often in battalions. Uh, uh, the Carter administration uh, uh, in late 1979, of course, uh, was also wrestling with the repercussions of the Iranian Revolution, the takeover of the American Embassy in 1979, uh, the Mecca shootings, the uh, sacking of our embassy uh, in uh, Islamabad uh, with the loss of two Americans, um, all of that in November 79, and then of course in December the uh, Soviets uh, were in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, a number of you have been there. For those of you who have not, um, uh, life in the National Security Council or indeed in the State Department doesn't quite play out exactly like West Wing did. Uh, um, we, we put together, as uh, some of you recall, um, um, a, um, shall we say, a complex alliance. Um, if there was a single unifying theme that um, brought together the anti-Soviet Afghan elements, it was the notion of um, uh, a jihad against the godless invader. Uh, that was probably the single point of unity uh, among the disparate groups. And externally, of course, we worked uh, with um, particular closeness with the Pakistanis, um, uh, but also the Saudis uh, <coughs> and other Gulf Arabs. And, you know, you know what? It worked. Um, uh, in 1989, of course, the Soviets had um, uh, had all the pain they could stand in Afghanistan um, at a time when it was clear to their leadership 
that their problems at home um, were somewhere beyond serious and approaching critical. Um, couldn't, couldn't afford it anymore as opposition uh, grew. Um, so the Soviets were defeated in Afghanistan, um, a victory for the United States um, in what turned out to be the uh, closing years of the uh, Cold War. And what did we do? We said, hey, we won. Let's go home. Um, and um, home we went. Uh, we, of course, were not engaged with uh, conventional forces on the ground uh, in the Afghan campaign, but we were very heavily engaged by a variety of means. Uh, that engagement stopped not just in Afghanistan, uh, but also in the region, particularly in Pakistan, um, uh, where uh, in the space of a little over a year, Pakistan went from being, as they put it, the most allied of US allies uh, to the most sanctioned of um, US adversaries. Um, that, of course, was through the administration's decision uh, not to renew waiver requests for the Pressler Amendment um, on Pakistan's uh, nuclear program, which we had known all about since the mid-1970s when Zulfikar Ali Bhutto publicly announced it. But we found it expedient to just say, well, we've got um, other more important issues. Well, those issues went away, and so did the Pressler Amendment waivers, and so did all economic um, uh, and military assistance for Pakistan, uh, except for some very uh, narrowly circumscribed areas, mainly due to, uh, mainly to do with narcotics control. Um, and the rest, as they say, is, um, is history. A very predictable history is the seven main uh, jihadi groups with no Soviets left to fight and to serve as a unifying factor among them. Uh, uh, proceeded uh, to engage in a uh, an absolutely vicious civil war that uh, any informed observer could um, uh, reasonably predict. Uh, Kabul changed hands. Actually, how many times did Kabul change hands quickly? Three. <laughs> Three. Um, uh, with enormous devastation, but it wasn't our issue. Um, um, in the mid-70s, of course, um, a new movement uh, saw light uh, in the south, in Kandahar, uh, uh, the Taliban, um, uh, and taking advantage of, again, a number of factors, uh, international indifference, uh, war weariness and disgust on the part of the Afghan population, uh, Pakistani support who desperately wanted to see someone bring some kind of stability to a country on its borders, um, uh, managed to take control. Um, uh, clearly their ideology was not harmonious with ours, but hey, we could live with it. Uh, we've lived with other disharmonies around the world. Um, we had a series of efforts to engage them. Um, uh, and while these efforts were underway, an uh, increasingly inhospitable uh, East Africa for Al-Qaeda made uh, a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan look um, increasingly attractive. Um, uh, so their re relocation took place uh, in the 1990s. Um, East Africa bombings, some... Um, uh, really token missile strikes uh, subsequently that um, uh, rearranged some rocks. Um, and um, it was business pretty much as unusual. Um, uh, until 9-11. And then all of a sudden we cared. Um, my um, modern... Uh, story with Afghanistan actually goes back to that day. Um, 
Some of you, of course, have much longer and more continuous narratives, but um, I've got the mic, so this is my story. Uh, uh, I was on a um, US Air shuttle, the uh, 8 a.m. shuttle from Reagan up to LaGuardia, uh, newly appointed Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, uh, and um, I had uh, the portfolio of a country called Iraq in August 2001. Um, so my job was to go up and convince the Chinese, the Russians, and the French that um, our way was the right way, and I figured that would take half a day. Um, um, it was while we were making our uh, approach into LaGuardia that we could see smoke coming out of uh, the first tower. And just as we landed, all of our cell phones went off. We actually had cell phones in 2001 um, uh, with the news that uh, the second tower had been struck. And it was then clear this was not a misguided private aircraft uh, or some other av accident of navigation. It was an attack. Um, I was uh, stuck in traffic on the Queensboro Bridge uh, when both towers went down. Um, Three and a half months later, I was part of a small U.S. contingent raising the American flag over the opposite end of Ground Zero, uh, Kabul, Afghanistan, the still badly shattered American embassy, um, following a very quick military campaign that uh, ousted the Taliban. Um, I, I didn't spend those intervening three and a half months um, unoccupied. Um, I was on one of the first planes out of Dulles um, after they reopened airports following 9-11, uh, bound for Geneva and conversations under the UN flag with the Iranians. Um, uh, those of you who are deeply into esoteria and I would not suggest you admit who you are, just, just get counseling. Uh, 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 may have heard of the Geneva Group. Uh, this had been in existence for some years. It was a forum um, uh, to talk about uh, theoretical futures for Afghanistan and refugee issues that brought together countries um, with um, significant uh, political or refugee Afghan populations. Uh, um, like Italy, Germany, Iran, and the U.S. Um, it never was taken seriously, at least by us, until after 9-11. And then um, the Near East Bureau took it over. I was sent to head our delegation and immediately began discussions um, with the Iranians on OK, as they would say it. We warned you, uh, now look at what you've got. What are we going to do about it? Um, uh, those discussions um, led up to the Bonn Conference. Uh, again, as you know, the um, uh, selection of Hamid Karzai to lead Afghanistan uh, had as the core of its consensus a U.S.-Iranian understanding in which Lakhtar Brahimi was uh, very influential and uh, for which uh, uh, Jim Dobbins, uh, uh, my former colleague and friend, uh, deserves enormous credit. Um, uh, during those pre-attack discussions, uh, and you remember the air war began in early October, the Iranian thrust was, you know, what do you need to know to knock their blocks off? Uh, you want their order of battle? Here's the map. You want to know where we think their weak points are? Here, here, and here. You want to know how we think they're going to react uh, to an air campaign? Do you want to know how we think uh, the Northern Alliance will behave? Ask us. We got the answers. We've been working with those guys for years. Um, uh, this was an unprecedented period since the revolution of, um, again, a U.S.-Iranian dialogue uh, on a particular issue where we very much had common interests and common cause. Um, and as I said, uh, it was our 
cooperation, and I don't mean to diminish or minimize that of other actors. Uh, I already mentioned Lakhdar Brahimi in the United Nations, but uh, the entire international community rallied around the uh, composition of the Afghan interim authority. Um, our, our conversations continued, and uh, lest you fear that I am going to give you every week between uh, uh, late 2001 and current time, be assured, I just, again, setting the stage here because uh, we so often leap to the present uh, without remembering there is a past that everyone except us uh, has a focus on. Um, uh, uh, we actually, you know, hit Geneva, Paris, New York. Um, um, we were um, we were very portable ourselves and the Iranians, um, uh, and Kabul, because my senior in, uh, Iranian interlocutor um, got himself posted to Kabul um, as their chief of mission. About the same time, I showed up as uh, our chief of mission. Um, and again, we were able to talk about where Al-Qaeda might be in Iran and what, what they might do about it. Um, um, uh, not without some effect. Uh, we talked about development, who could build which roads. Uh, we even got into such issues as uh, standardizing the composition of asphalt uh, for roads that would adjoin. Um, uh, and we talked about how we might work together to reduce the influence of warlords with whom uh, each of us had uh, respective influence. But then came um, Axis of Evil, State of the Union, January 2002. Um, I remember fairly clearly my next encounter with my Iranian colleague. Um, uh, those things in life that are least pleasant uh, Stay, you, stay with you the longest and with the greatest clarity. Uh, and um, it was not a happy encounter. Um, uh, that was the time, and he was gracious enough to inform me, that uh, the Iranian government chose to um, export uh, Golbadin Hikmatyar back to uh, Afghanistan. Um, we narrowly missed him at the time, um, and uh, we are still missing him. Um, uh, uh, in the kinetic sense, believe me, not in the sympathetic sense. Um, um, uh, this was also the point, and here I am indulging in conjecture. It's great to be a free man. I can do that. Uh, um, this was also the point, I think, where the Iranians made a strategic decision, uh, which is can't work with those sons of bitches. Told you all along, can't do it. Um, and I think uh, that um, up until that time, uh, the notion that, well, maybe we can find common ground on certain issues and see where they go, maybe, was held in the um, IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, and uh, including by its leader, Qasem Soleimani. Um, that, uh, to, to the extent that it was there, I could only see its reflections in the, in the uh, individuals I was talking to. It certainly wasn't there after January of 2002. Um, uh, although talks continued, but with increasingly less result and uh, uh, with uh, increasingly less authoritative um, representation on the Iranian side. I, I mention all of this uh, to illustrate something I'll come back to, um, uh, which is the law of unintended consequences. Um, uh, in the international arena, and particularly in the complex parts of the world uh, where so many of us uh, have chosen or been blackmailed into serving, uh, um, it's not just, you know, obvious stuff that any uh, anybody with a high school education, if they'd looked at it for half an hour, would have figured it out. Uh, it's the unintended consequences, not of 
second and third order, but of 20th and 30th order. Um, that when major um, actions are set in motion, and no action is more major than a military engagement, um, uh, and sometimes diplomatic engagements, uh, decisions to go and then decisions over what to do then set in motion currents and forces that the most astute among us um, cannot begin to predict. Uh, so when these decisions are made, it is not simply a question of thinking through their implications carefully. It is asking the question, how much risk am I ready to assume? How much of the unknown and the unknowable um, am I prepared to absorb to deal with that which uh, has already struck me or may threaten me? Um, uh, you know, again, a certain degree of uh, modesty and humility uh, on the part of those of us who advise or make policy in terms of what we can presume to know and predict uh, uh, would uh, well serve the, uh, the national interest. Um, again, I was yo-yoing uh, uh, about a good bit at that time. Um, um, uh, taking um, some leave of absence from my Iraq responsibilities, um, uh, but not all that much. I was in northern Iraq in December 2001, suggesting to our Kurdish friends that it would be nice if they did not start the war before we were ready. And, um, uh, actually getting the call as I crossed the border saying, uh, gee, we kind of need you to be in Afghanistan, you know, a week from Friday. Um, um, came back from Afghanistan in the spring, immediately went back to northern Iraq. Um, um, uh, so, you know, a case of badly uh, divided attention that is all, of course, Ashley Tellis's fault. Um, um, you know, I, I will remember my arrival in Kabul just a few days after New Year's 2002. Um, I, I had seen devastation before. Uh, I had never seen anything that looked like Afghanistan uh, at the beginning uh, of that year, a decade and a half ago. Um, Kabul itself, when we finally got there, um, uh, looked like parts of Berlin in 1945, whole city blocks obliterated. Uh, no power, no water, no services, uh, no security forces, no nothing. Um, uh, you know, we didn't do it. Taliban did a little, but not a lot. Um, Soviets didn't really contribute much. It was that Afghan civil war we chose to ignore. Um, um, and um, the incredible um, devastation that the allies of the anti-Soviet Jihad wrought on their own country and citizenry when there was no longer a unifying force to unite them or um, an international presence and commitment that said, let's look for other ways. Um, um, President Karzai, then Chairman Karzai, had gotten to Kabul about 10 days before I had, after the Bonn Conference in December. Um, and he's been there ever since. Um, and uh, again, as the history of Afghanistan gets written, rewritten, revised, redacted, um, uh, and otherwise colorized, um, I, I hope that due attention is given to the role of, um, of Hamid Karzai because he has literally personified uh, the post-Taliban Afghanistan uh, from that time until this and uh, God willing uh, until the 2014 election. Um, uh, several things struck me about him. Um, uh, first, his incredible courage in taking on 
uh, a job that was somewhere beyond impossible. Uh, as he struggled to come up with someone who might be capable of actually running a province uh, um, uh, that wouldn't plot a coup at the same time um, or steal whatever little may be left to steal. Uh, uh, while he was doodling around on a breakfast napkin trying to design the new Afghan flag. Um, uh, in addition to his courage and determination, uh, I was also struck by something that still strikes me today. Um, in my view, Hamid Karzai is a committed Afghan nationalist, um, by which I mean he thinks in national terms. He, he knows his base uh, lies with the Pashtuns. He knows the future of Afghanistan lies with all of its significant populations, uh, be that based on uh, sectarian, ethnic, or gender identity, feel that they have a home and a future. Um, and uh, he worked from that day to this um, uh, in a five-dimensional chess game uh, to try to maintain and foster those balances, uh, again, against uh, extraordinary odds. Um, it is, again, a question that Afghans and friends of Afghanistan need to be asking themselves as we look ahead to the 2014 elections. Um, there are not many people who think like that in Afghanistan. More now, certainly, than there were a decade ago. Um, but um, uh, still a minority. Um, <clears throat> So, beginning of 2002, there we are. We're on the ground. Um, international consensus behind an interim authority. Um, so now what? Uh, yeah, Crocker, now what? You're out there, figure it out. Um, uh, I did not uh, arrive in Kabul with a detailed set of instructions uh, as to what the administration wished to have accomplished um, in those initial months. In fact, I arrived without any instructions. Just go figure something out. It's a, um, um, uh, this was, uh, again, regime change on the cheap. Um, if that sounds a little familiar, maybe it is. Um, uh, my first rule when moving into conflict or immediate post-conflict situations is lash up tight with the military commander. He's got the guns. Um, you know, guns can be very useful in staying alive. Um, uh, I couldn't find one. Uh, well, you know, yeah, we got a special forces commander uh, who covers <coughs> the northern part of Afghanistan from Kharshi Khanabad. Uh, up in Uzbekistan, uh, we got a special forces commander out of Kandahar who covers the south. Um, uh, we've got a um, Marine Expeditionary Unit commander uh, who's uh, got his uh, uh, brigade plus. Um, and guess what? They were all 06s, colonels. None of them reported to each other. None of them really had a requirement to coordinate with each other. And they certainly didn't have a requirement to coordinate anything with me or even pick up the phone when I called, which I couldn't do because, of course, there were no telephones. Um, um, we, we did not have even an approach um, to unified military command in Afghanistan uh, until um, uh, Major, then Major General Buster Hagenbeck arrived with the headquarters element um, and one brigade of the 10th Mountain Division in late February 2002. Um, and even then, not everybody was uh, reporting to him. Um, There's a great British officer named John McCall. Uh, he was the first uh, commander of what is now ISAF, uh, Major General at the time. And uh, um, 
not finding an American counterpart, I said, well, you know, you're a commander. You know, you speak English. Uh, we led a successful revolt against you. Uh, there must be something in that. Let's talk. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we kind of looked at all those warlords and militias out there, uh, the absence of any kind of ability by the chairman, Chairman Karzai, to extend authority and said, uh, you know, can't we do better than this? How about if we sort of put a, uh, a reinforced company plus in each major population center backed up by uh, an air mobile uh, brigade that could deploy anywhere with very heavy firepower uh, uh, in a matter of an hour or two. Uh, you know, we plus up a brigade and a little bit more, uh, but our our reach, our influence, our capacity to influence events and maintain security goes up exponentially. So we co-authored this, sent it off, and um, in record time, we got very similar instructions back from our respective capitals, which was basically go sit under a tree until that idiot idea passes. Um, <laughs> Uh, we are putting nothing else into what has been a successful campaign. Um, I will let you fast forward from um, uh, that date until uh, the announcement of the surge in December 2009. Um, um, let me say just one preliminary word about the insurgency, then I really will fast forward. Um, the insurgency surprised me, not because it came or it came when it did, but because it took longer to develop than I thought it would. Um, uh, I was present for Operation Anaconda. Um, uh, again, you can mention that to your counselor when you see him about the, um, uh, the Geneva talks or her. Um, uh, that was our first um, uh, large-scale effort to mop up uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, remnants in the uh, mountainous east. Um, uh, General Hagenbeck um, had lots of advice uh, from every echelon above him, um, uh, the wonders of uh, VTCs uh, that actually worked then and we all wish they didn't. Uh, uh, lots of advice, uh, lots of superior commanders, um, most of whom weren't in his chain of command, but that didn't slow them down, um, um, but very few forces. Um, and what we found in Anaconda uh, uh, is we had a much larger, much better armed and prepared and tenacious enemy than we thought we did. Um, we also didn't have some of those useful things like tanks. Um, not a good idea to carry out major ground operations if you don't have armor, just a civilian, you know, what do I know? Um, we, we had to borrow tanks from the Tajik Northern Alliance. Um, T-54, T-55s uh, aren't much unless they're against an adversary who hasn't got anything. Uh, so they seemed useful to us and my job was to negotiate their passage through Pashtun uh, controlled areas with Tajik crews and supporting infantry uh, to help us on uh, Objective Anaconda. Um, uh, and that almost didn't happen because um, uh, the Pashtun leader of the area, um, who later met an untimely death, or timely, depending on how you look at it, or way too late, depending on how you look at it, um, uh, refused passage and said if they tried, uh, they would be destroyed. And it took an all-night negotiation to say that, basically, you come after these tanks, uh, we are going to come after you. And if you haven't been on the business end of an F-16, um, you're, you're going to have about a half a second to experience it. And they said, oh, OK. Um, so you know, we prevailed in Anaconda, kind of, sort of. Uh, you know, By the time we had enough power up there uh, to make the outcome decisive, most of whom we were fighting had exfilled. The other thing that uh, was an uh-oh moment for me uh, back then, again, 
late February, early March uh, 2002, uh, was uh, particularly in the early days of the campaign, uh, the, the filtration went two ways. Uh, we were picking young Afghans up who were trying to cross our lines uh, to get on the fighting side of them, uh, to join their uh, compatriots in the fight from the center. And that's when I thought, you know, there could be trouble down the line. What do I know? Uh, I got to go worry about Iraq. Um, uh, so again, you know, hindsight is 2020. It's always beautiful, but I do remember having that concern that, as we have seen, and our predecessors as Western powers have seen for hundreds of years, um, uh, the conflict in a given foreign country. Uh, in the eyes of our adversary hasn't even really started until we think we have gained a decisive victory. Um, we saw it in Afghanistan, we saw it in Iraq, the French saw it, Morocco, Algeria, uh, the Italians saw it in Libya, the Brits throughout the region over and over and over. Uh, we operate on different timelines, none more profound than this. Um, our enemy's capacity to wait, uh, our capacity to think, got her done here, let's move on to the next small country that needs help. Um, um, okay, uh, again, a lot more background than you needed, but it doesn't get told often and uh, um, uh, I just uh, thought it might be useful to review. God, Ashley, you're going to kill me. Uh, in part because of what today is. Um, avid New York Times readers, also a subject for therapy. Uh, um, um, you know, we'll have seen an op ed piece today recalling for us that this is the 30th anniversary of the Sabra Shatila massacres. Um, and it notes in passing that a young foreign service officer named Ryan Crocker was the American diplomat who walked into those camps and discovered and reported that massacre. Um, uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, going back to my 20th and 30th order consequences, set in motion a chain of events we could not or they possibly have dreamed of. No one could have imagined when they crossed the line of departure um, um, in, uh, in June of 82, that you would have a Saber Shatila. At least I certainly couldn't. Um, uh, that invasion led to the cementing of the Iranian-Syrian strategic alliance uh, that has persisted to this day and may be in some jeopardy, one may hope. Uh, Although what may come after the Assad regime is uh, the subject of another lecture. It may not be good. Uh, it also led to the birth of Hezbollah, uh, which has not only bedeviled us and the Israelis, it has killed hundreds, hundreds of both Americans and Israelis. Again, law of unforeseen consequences, again, 30 years, 30 years later. All right, okay, okay, I won't, I won't go back. That's it, I promise. Uh, um, okay, so where are we today? Um, okay, first, uh, I believe since I was out there for a lot of it and saw the consequences, um, uh, the surge ordered by President Obama, the addition of the 38,000 troops, um, uh, had a huge positive impact on security. Um, uh, uh, now, as we draw down to the pre-surge number, uh, I think it is extremely important that we take the time that uh, General Allen has recommended for a careful, methodical assessment of where we are, where the Afghans are, where our adversaries are, uh, what does the battle space look like going forward before we make any more decisions. Um, and the merciful uh, element here, of course, is that kind of assessment will carry us past uh, November 6th. Um, um, 
the status of the Afghan National Security Forces. Um, an amazing achievement in a very short period of time. It's not just uh, uh, a little over a decade. It's really just the last three years or so that we have been engaged in a truly serious effort to um, build a capable, multifaceted set of security forces, uh, both uh, 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 police and, uh, and army. Um, close to their maximum strength of 352,000. Um, uh, and they have shown their abilities uh, in action. You will remember the uh, inadvertent uh, uh, desecration of the Quran in the uh, early part of this year that led to uh, uh, widespread spread demonstrations, some of them violent. By definition, international forces could not be part of the effort to restore control. The Afghans were on their own. You know, we couldn't even use advisors. It would be simply gasoline on the fire. Um, they, weren't, uh, they weren't prepared for that. They weren't trained for that. They weren't equipped for that. And there is nothing harder to ask of an armed force than to go into action against its own population. Uh, yet that they did, and they did so with, uh, given the circumstances, extraordinary effectiveness. Um, uh, they saved countless lives. They saved American lives, uh, protecting our presence and installations in a number of places around the country. Uh, and the loss of Afghan light, while regrettable, a total of 29, that includes Afghan security forces, uh, far less than it might have been. So. We saw not a not a dress rehearsal. Um, we saw the curtain go up without a rehearsal, um, and a very credible uh, performance by um, uh, Afghan security forces. Uh, why do I start with this? Um, because again, if you look back at the post-Soviet era, you know Najibullah, his government, and Central Authority did not come crashing down when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan. Did not come crashing down when Soviet advisors were withdrawn from Afghan security forces. They did a very good job holding their own on their own. Uh, it all came crashing down when they stopped being paid, when the money stopped, 92. Uh, Army disintegrated. They followed their uh, ethnic or sectarian uh, affiliations, and um, the rest is history, uh, and not a very pretty one. Um, so a competent, by, um, certainly by Afghan standards, um, a committed uh, force, but uh, you know it helps to keep paying your troops. And I'll come back to this uh, when I talk about US interests, which I will do very swiftly. Um, uh, you know, what else is different uh, from the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s? Uh, well, a tremendous amount. You've got to be there to see it. Uh, Kabul is a, a bustling uh, 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 Middle East, or Middle, uh, South Asian metropolis. I stumble over that because it really is an intricate combination of both. Uh, the streets are packed, traffic is horrendous, stores are open, schools are open. Um, you know, we've gone from 900,000 kids uh, in school when I got there, all of them boys, in the beginning of 2002, over 8 million today. Um, uh, enormous strides uh, forward in um, uh, the education sector, as I mentioned, uh, certainly in health as life expectancy has increased. Uh, in transportation, um, uh, not every road project has been a success, but boy, oh boy, getting around Afghanistan today is a world different than it was uh, a decade ago. Telecommunications, um, electricity, all um, almost immeasurably better than they were uh, a little over a decade ago. Lots of problems, lots of mistakes, lots of missteps. Uh, but overall, the progress has been incredible. 
There's an intangible in this too. It's the attitude of people, um, attitude of women. Uh, boy, you know, you hear that through clenched teeth. Nobody's ever going to jam me back in a burqa. Uh, uh, you see it with girls who didn't experience it. Um, but, you know, you walk into a class, whenever I had a bad day in Afghanistan, which would be every day, uh, you, you can always buck yourself up a little by, by visiting classes from, from university down to primary. And, you know, asking, asking the students what do they want to do. Um, you know, virtually all of them had great dreams and wanted to see them fulfilled in Afghanistan. Um, and I was amazed at the number of girls that want to be doctors, engineers, fighter pilots, paratroopers. Uh, you know, there is a new spirit out there among women and among younger people. And the, uh, as, as we look at 2014, uh, watch that young generation, watch the females. Uh, uh, because what you hear from the 20-somethings is, man, you know, our parents and grandparents destroyed this country. Um, uh, we're going to build something that is entirely different. Um, you know, good luck to them. Um, their grandparents, in many cases, are still unfortunately healthy. Um, uh, so there's a lot on the positive side of the ledger that, that we can talk about. Um, let me talk about the challenges. And the challenges are also the opportunities. One of them we touched on is elections. Um, um, I mean, the good news here is everybody wants to be in on it. Uh, everybody's maneuvering, you know, been maneuvering for the last year at least, so kind of like U.S. primaries, uh, do some straw polls, uh, see where your alliances are, check your adversary's strengths, uh, see what you got on him. In every case, it's murder, but he's got that on you, so it's a wash. It's a, um, um, uh, you know, I, I've, I've dealt with um, two northern alliances. Uh, the northern alliance in Iraq, the Kurds, and the northern alliance in Afghanistan. Um, the um, uh, uh, Tajik, Uzbek, Turkmen, with uh, uh, some peculiarities, the Hazara, uh, when they could get up there. Um, uh, they want to play in the center. Um, they want to be governors. Uh, they like having it both ways. Um, uh, they would like to be kings, but I don't think many of them expect that at this juncture, um, but kingmakers. Um, they, they, they want to have decisive voices uh, in who leads this country and where they lead it to. Um, and, you know, unlike the Kurds, th these are the guys who took Kabul. Um, you know, it wasn't us, it was them. Um, yet, rather than say, it is our right to rule this state as president, uh, it's different. Uh, it is our right to live as free and equal citizens in this state and to have a role in shaping the state that does take account um, of how we stood, where we stood, and what we did uh, during the dark days of the 90s. Um, um, you know, again, there are exceptions, uh, but by and large, uh, I think this is a, uh, this is a key point. Um, uh, what will you be looking at in terms of contenders? Uh, you know, I'm not going to name names. Uh, be meaningless at this point in any case. I, I think you can see structures to a bit, to an extent. Um, personalities will count hugely as they did in 2009, um, uh, but so will coalitions. And I, I think there's a prospect, there are certainly those who see political advantage in some cross-cutting coalitions. Uh, again, not the 20-somethings, they're still too young, but the early 40-somethings talking about, okay, well, I'm a Tajik. Uh, I really need to hook up with um, Pashtuns who have experienced many of the things I have and where we both have more in common with each other than we do with uh, uh, our older generations. Uh, you're not going to see agenda-based parties. 
in the modern sense. It, you know, maybe the election after this one, um, uh, but beyond platitudes, uh, beyond you know a chicken in every pot, uh, I, I still think development has a way to go uh, before that happens. Let me say a word about the role of Karza. I want to come back to this. Um, here are my fearless predictions. Uh, since I am utterly irresponsible, um, I can make any prediction I want. Uh, uh, unless circumstances change dramatically, I am uh, quite confident uh, President Karzai will not seek to amend the Constitution or to find some extra constitutional mechanism uh, that would allow either for prolongation or his reelection. Um, uh, he said it publicly, he said it privately. Um, uh, in a number of conversations, I, you know, I've heard him talk about the future he envisions. Um, uh, the future he envisions is uh, a future. Um, one in which he's actually alive. Um, and again, sitting here where uh, uh, our election losers go into opposition or um, equally likely or maybe both go into highly lucrative business or law practices and make tons of bucks and come back another day. This is a part of the world that coined the phrase, two men, one grave. It's you or me. Um, and I see knowing smiles somewhere around. It, that goes back to the days of um, uh, Zia al Haq and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Um, uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto got the grave as former Prime Minister of Pakistan. Uh, so losing an election out in, in embryonic or unstable democracies um, uh, is, uh, is no joke. Um, so I think. You know, President Karzai, I, I, this Putin stuff just kills me. Uh, you know, President Karzai is a lot of things. He is not Vladimir Putin. Uh, um, uh, Afghanistan does not work that way. Uh, but he is going to want to see an election outcome that he literally can live with, um, where a successor will not have him brought up on capital charges. Um, which could happen in a state where the rule of law is not exactly well established. Um, uh, so, you know, not a kingmaker, but uh, looking to, to um, see contenders emerge uh, with whom he can coexist, um, very likely on the same compound for security reasons. Um, uh, so the elections, again, a huge multifaceted challenge and opportunity. It will be the first election of the post-Karzai era, uh, something Afghanistan has not experienced since the fall of the Taliban, um, uh, and worthy of our not only our close attention, but our deep interest, which is not the same as interference. Um, let, let me say just another word about uh, Hamid Karzai, because I, again, I got to know him immediately after we both arrived in Kabul, developed uh, high respect for him at that time, have maintained the relationship over the years. I used to come over from Pakistan um, when I was ambassador there from 04 to 07 and uh, explain to President Karzai my view that uh, uh, the Pakistanis and its leadership uh, uh, were not out to destroy him in Afghanistan. He said, oh, yes, they are. And then um, we'd uh, move on to a more pleasant conversation. I didn't move him a bit, but we maintained a, um, we maintained a relationship. Um, uh, Karzai as nationalist. Um, uh, it takes two forms. I talked about one of them. Um, and this touches on another challenge, uh, which is reconciliation. Uh, President Karzai believes in this. I believe in it. Uh, General Allen, who was the architect to the Anbar awakening uh, and commands now in Afghanistan, believes in it. Uh, you don't kill your way out of an insurgency. Um, at the same time, President Karzai is keenly aware you cannot have reconciliation with your adversaries uh, and in the process lose your allies. Uh, in other words, it cannot be on terms that alienate 
the minorities because they feel their rights uh, have been bargained away. Um, and uh, you cannot do it on terms that threaten what uh, women in Afghanistan have achieved. And I think the best uh, indication of where the president's mind is on this was the painful process he pursued to select a successor as chairman of the High Peace Council um, after uh, Orhan Adin Rabbani was assassinated a year ago. Um, uh, a year ago in two days, three days. Uh, a couple of... Um, Pashtuns or individuals perceived as Pashtuns with great seniority and respect wanted the position. Uh, the president decided early on uh, it should be Rabbani's son, Salah Hadin. Uh, and he eventually prevailed, uh, not uh, without asking that certain Western powers interfere blatantly in Afghanistan's internal affairs, which I happily did. Um, um, uh, the two individuals, uh, uh, Afga Afghanistan's elder statesman, um, uh, Professor Mujadidi, uh, although ethnically an Arab, is perceived as a Pashtun, and uh, uh, the highly respected Pir Gilani, um, uh, also half Arab, um, uh, but perceived as a Pashtun, uh, Karzai felt would threaten and frighten uh, non-Pashtuns. Uh, now, is a Tajik High Peace Council leader going to be um, instantly empathetic with uh, Taliban who want to cross over? Not likely. Uh, but again, it shows where Karzai's priorities are in my view, which is hang on to the solidarity, the unity that you have. Don't risk it going after what you don't have. Um, uh, we've talked about security and security forces uh, simply to say the threats, as we have seen, are very much there, uh, whether it be that coordinated attack on Camp Bastion that uh, destroyed a number of aircraft, only 15 or so uh, gunmen, but they clearly knew what they were doing. Um, the high-profile attacks, um, which haven't worked that well, uh, by and large as headline grabbers uh, after uh, the attack on the embassy last year and again in April, and the very troubling green on blue attacks. Um, you know, I'm not there, uh, but I would put the percentage of uh, attackers who have some affiliation with the Taliban rather higher than the percentages I have seen. Um, I think they're finding that uh, a relatively easy to do. You know, our own vetting in the U.S. military is not that great. Let's face it. Uh, Why well, you got a lot of prison barracks at uh, military facilities uh, from people who never should have gotten in in the first place and didn't get out of boot camp? Uh, how is it in Afghanistan? I, I think that the Taliban have found a niche. Obviously not the whole story. I don't discount the personal grudge, the cultural insensitivity, and the rest of it. But I, I think we underestimate at our peril a resilient enemy finding a new, a new mechanism uh, with effect. Um, uh, we've talked about reconciliation. Um, um, the economy, I, I would just say uh, that I don't think 2014 is going to be as calamitous as a, uh, an economic development as, as many think is the case, assuming a, a virtual complete drawdown of international forces. An awful lot of the money spent on contracting um, has gone offshore anyway. Um, uh, what the Afghans are attempting to do through their extractive industries uh, uh, and elsewhere is kind of build up what they need to do in any case um, um, an indigenous um, economic growth capability. Let the private sector do what it does best. No, not steal money. That's the government. Uh, um, God, it's great not to be an official anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
and, and generally, you know, just let let the economy work. There is a significant amount to work with. Um, internationally, engagement, engagement, engagement. Um, we had three very important conferences during my tenure, um, actually four. Um, you know, the Bonn Conference last December, that was an affirmation of international political support for Afghanistan. The Chicago Summit, which was an affirmation of international financial support for the Afghan National Security Forces in the out years. Um, uh, and this is key, you know, no more 1992s. Um, and then, of course, the Tokyo Ministerial, uh, which focused on economic support uh, as important as the commitments of the international community were, the commitments of the Afghans also were extremely important in recognizing and agreeing to take on uh, the challenges of regulation, of governance, of corruption, and so forth. They are not blind to these issues. Uh, and uh, the president was very, very public on it. Um, so the international dimension going forward, very, very key. We, you know, we know how the movie ran uh, at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. We just guessed at it in um, Iraq. You know, General Petraeus and I in 2007 in front of Congress, uh, you know, what the hell did we know? But I thought we told a good story. Um, in, in Afghanistan, we do know. Uh, the same adversaries who ran that country in the 90s want it back. And they are, as they are committed, they are resilient, they are tough, they are smart. I mean, after all, we have killed all the slow and stupid ones. Um, um, and in my judgment, the Taliban, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda linkage post bin Laden, while there may be some in Taliban who have a different view, still pretty solid. Taliban get back, stand by for Al-Qaeda. Uh, they may be weakened, but Afghanistan is the field of choice in a way that Yemen can never be for reasons that those of you who know Yemen will understand. Uh, you will never get uh, uh, a homogenous Yemeni view on anything whatsoever in the world, uh, let alone the desirability of having al-Qaeda as neighbors. Um, it was different in Afghanistan and it could be different again. Uh, so I would conclude really um, uh, long after I should have, um, you know, what kind of future? Um, uh, in Afghanistan, that is good enough to maintain stability in a precarious region. With security forces good enough not to eliminate every security threat, but to be the, the forced, force of first resort in dealing with it. Uh, in Afghanistan, with good enough governance, um, uh, that its people look to it for services. Um, expect those services. We'll never be happy with the level of services. I mean, like, are we? Uh, uh, but sees that government as legitimate, both in terms of how it was chosen, but far more important in what and how it delivers. Um, um, uh, and how it looks after, again, all of its citizenry. That, that no major element of the Afghan population ever again feel that an Afghan government um, is persecuting it or worse. Um, I think President Karzai has stood with uneven results because he's had the worst job in the world. Um, I, I hope his successor can carry that, um, that forward. Um, uh, why is it important? Uh, two quick points. Uh, one of them is just three numbers, 911. Um, it did happen. It could happen again. If it did happen again, the most likely way it would happen would be from a Taliban controlled Afghanistan. So, you know, it may cost uh, the international community four and a half billion dollars a, a year to um, uh, field a reasonably well-sized and equipped Afghan security force into the future, uh, that's pretty cheap insurance. 
given what a 9-11 costs. Um, uh, second reason, I think, uh, is an argument that should resonate with Americans. Um, if we decide we're done before the Afghans really do take a grip, uh, if they start seriously slipping, we're backing out. The uh, Haqqanis, Commander Nazir, the various flavors of the Taliban are gaining and gaining and gaining. Who gets it in the neck? It's all those people we made all those promises to. Um, it starts with the women. Uh, you know, I was there when some of those undertakings were made back in 2002. Uh, you have women all over government now. You have women running companies. Uh, you have women educating other women. Um, uh, I think we as Americans, since we brought them forward to see what would happen to them, uh, would be something that we as a nation would have a lot of trouble living with. At least I certainly hope so as an American. Uh, likewise, for those 20-somethings um, and early 30-somethings, who want to achieve a different Afghanistan uh, and have it within their capability if there is enough time for them to do so. So for those reasons, and I can go on, um, we need to maintain focus, we need to remember the past, um, we need to make the commitment and the investment um, for our national security, and I define national security as also encompassing very much uh, our moral and our human values. Let us not lose sight of them. I have not covered the region because you would have literally given me the hook, but happy to talk about uh, 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 Iran, uh, the, uh, the Stans, and of course particularly Pakistan, uh, but um, lest, lest even my introducer fall asleep, I will uh, <laughs> leave you, whatever shred of time is left for questions. Thank you, absolutely. We have a few minutes of questions. I want to give as many people a chance to ask them. So if I could urge you to be pointed and specific, introduce yourself, and if you can ask the question very quickly. I'll just call upon as many people as that comments. Yes, sir. Uh, can you wait for the microphone, please? Yes, I am uh, Dr. Nishar Chaudhary with Pakistan American League. It's uh, good to see you again and listen to the enlightened conversation. I had been meeting the ambassador every time I visited Islamabad. And even in Muzaffarabad, we had a meeting when Karen Hughes and Christina Rafa and yourself came together. We received them there. Uh, you had uh, mentioned uh, exclusively about Afghanistan. But the problems in that area are many regional problems, things that are spilling over. And even the stability of Afghanistan and Pakistan has become interdependent in many ways. How would you shed light on this, that uh, in Pakistan, the shrines of Sufis, mosques, civilians, army people, personnel, soft targets, there are so many killings being done by Taliban. And the same Taliban also, then they are called Afghan Taliban, they are doing the same thing inside Afghanistan. I mean, US army people, NATO forces, Afghan forces, civilians. So, what did you figure out? What is exactly their motive, their intentions? How come they are only have become killers and they don't have a motive? If you could help us to figure out how do you really connect the stability, interdependence of stability between Pakistan and Afghanistan? Ryan, would you mind if I take two or three questions mm -hmm. out of time so that we can get as much coverage as we can? Yes, sir. The gentleman here, please. Ambassador uh, Mike Pesner of the U.S. Senate staff, uh, thank you very much for that tour de force. And uh, you mentioned the dangers of uh, ignoring a situation like we did in Afghanistan. You mentioned the dangers of unintended consequences. Now that you're out of government, what prescription would you give for the United States and the West regarding Syria? Thank you. <laughs> Taisy Schaefer, nice to see you, Ryan. Hey, Taisy. You described Iran and uh, saying something you didn't, you described an adversary that had common interests with the United States. You served in Pakistan, which is a friend that has interests in Afghanistan that really don't track those of the United States. 
What kind of strategy would help the United States deal with this paradoxical situation? Uh, well, again, uh, good to see you, Dr. Javed, and know you're still fighting the good fight, uh, which I, I fully appreciate is not an easy one these days. Um, uh, you know, there is a great variety of um, militants loose in the lands of both countries. Um, uh, some of them in um, overt linkages uh, with uh, each other, some not. Um, uh, but by and large, uh, uh, you know, I do think they, they have a discernible motive, uh, uh, which is bringing down the established orders in both countries. It is a negative motive. Um, I, I don't see much, uh, except in the case of the Taliban, I want to go back to the battle days and, and the uh, uh, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, I, I don't see much of a vision for the future uh, except everyone being dead or gone who doesn't think like them. Uh, uh, and I, I've been saddened by what I have seen occurring in Pakistan since my departure in 2007. The, um, the growth and strengthening of a, uh, an indigenous Pakistani militancy that is aiming, as you put it, at the Pakistani government, establishment, military, and the population. Um, um, what this tells me, and what I think all three governments um, are aware of, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the United States, is, whoa, uh, it's bad out there. Uh, it's bad for all of us. Uh, you know, Pakistani soldiers are dying in the northwest, or sorry, in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, I'm still back in the old days, um, uh, and uh, in the tribal areas, uh, it numbers higher than ever before, fighting the same guys who are killing Afghans and international forces in Afghanistan. Um, we've been through the ground lines of communication, um, uh, and the incidents that precipitated it. This is the time for that proverbial deep breath. Uh, again, which I think, uh, you know, Mark Grossman, of course, just out in the region, um, I think all three governments understand needs to be taken and say, okay, we have huge lists of grievances between and among us. Let us just set those aside for a minute uh, so we're not arguing over them while the wolf tears us apart. Uh, uh, and, and how can we fashion uh, a practical, coordinated approach? In my long experience in the region, what we have not done is um, evolved a working trilateral mechanism uh, that is senior enough uh, to carry weight and authority, but not so senior um, that it can't on itself make proposals or, or um, shape decisions. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, a couple of levels down. Uh, we've done that sporadically. We have not done it in a sustained fashion, and I think this is the time. Uh, India and Pakistan, of course, have done it for years. Uh, uh, at the foreign secretary level, more quietly at the level of national security advisor. Um, uh, perhaps great successes have not been registered, but great disasters have been avoided. Um, uh, and, and I would like to see a trilateral mechanism. It, it exists uh, at the foreign secretary level. It just has not produced anything because I don't think the participants have had adequate mandates. This is the time precisely for the reasons you state, uh, and that is what I would like to see uh, all three governments uh, focus on um, uh, moving forward. And I won't get into the complexities on the Pakistani side. You know them better than I, and we don't have that extra hour and a half. But uh, um, uh, to uh, Ambassador Schaefer, um, I, I guess the... Uh, I'll give you a flip answer, which isn't completely flip, and then a more detailed one. You know, first, it ain't, it ain't 2001, 2002 anymore. Um, 
you know, it was after 9-11 that uh, President Musharraf made his historic decisions on the, uh, the overflight routes, the resupply routes, basically to line up with the U.S. Uh, uh, in the fight against uh, Taliban and al-Qaeda. Uh, you know, he took these decisions and implemented them uh, uh, before there was really a whiff of an insurgency. That, that, came, that came several years later. Uh, so if you're comparing, you've you got to compare in time uh, where we were 0102 with Pakistan, which was in a pretty reasonable place, and where we were with Afghanistan, which, or with Iran, which also, you know, showed promise. Uh, uh, both went south. Uh, in, in very different ways and very different levels of magnitude, but that was in subsequent years. Uh, I think a real question is, okay, is there a way to um, uh, return to some kind of discussion with Iran, um, brokered through the UN, not track to, please, uh, um, I think there may be, um, and here's why I think it's important. Uh, the Iranians have always pulled their punches in Afghanistan. They, they could have been a lot worse than they have been. Um, uh, the only um, explosively formed projectile, EFP, that killed so many Americans in Afghanistan, we've ever found evidence of uh, in in, in Iraq, sorry. The, the only one we've ever found evidence of in Afghanistan was an inert one that we believe was left for us to find. Um, uh, as a reminder, say, you know, we're only using one hand and only three fingers on that hand. Um, they're not doing that to say it's because we're fundamentally nice people and we don't want to hurt anybody. Uh, I think it is a signal that they're, you know, still is perhaps something to talk about. And I, I would like to see us uh, explore that if we can. Now, I got to tell you, I, uh, you know, I have one great quality that I've always brought to the Foreign Service, uh, which is my inherent uh, expendability, you know, <laughs> ship them out. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, you know, we didn't lose much, uh, <laughs> you know. So I, I maintained an authority to engage the Iranians. Uh, uh, I had it... Uh, obviously going back to 01, 02, 03, had it again the whole time I was in Iraq, uh, did so and retained it in Afghanistan. Uh, couldn't find any Afghan or any Iranian ready to take me up on it. Uh, you know, maybe it's because I was standing in front of their gates saying, uh, hey, uh, I'm the American ambassador. <laughs> Want to go out for a cup of coffee? So, uh, um, but I, I, I think it is still out there worth creative minds pursuing, and I think we've just found another great project for you and Howie. Good luck. Um, uh, Syria, you know, I, I was ambassador uh, to Syria for three fun-filled years. Uh, that included the transition from um, uh, Hafez to Bashar. Our uh, fearless prediction at the time, because I got to know Bashar before his father died. Uh, we had a series of one-on-ones, which we conducted in Arabic, not because my Arabic is perfect, but it was better than his English, even though he studied uh, ophthalmology in um, the UK. That's all he did. Uh, he went to classes. He studied his uh, lectures. He read his textbooks. He in no way entered into British social life. His English has since become quite good. I think it is why surging. But Bashar is like his father, except worse, um, uh, less flexible, um, more doctrinaire, uh, less agile, and aware that he doesn't have his father's support. Uh, so I think this is um, it's going to be a fight to the finish. Um, uh, no happy villa for Bashar in Jeddah. I would like to be wrong on that. Um, but even if there is, uh, we've already seen the signs of it. Um, just like what um, uh, happened to my, uh, my friend Chris and his colleagues, uh, the Arab Spring bears bitter fruit. Um, and nowhere, I am afraid, could it be more bitter 
than in Syria, where we're already seeing the signs of um, uh, sectarian uh, divisions, tensions, and hatred surface, uh, even with Bashar still in the palace. Um, um, you know, again, uh, the past isn't past in Syria. Uh, uh, Hama was the day before yesterday, February 1982, the annihilation of a city to uh, get at the Muslim Brotherhood. The Sunnis will settle scores, uh, and I would not want to be an Alawi in Syria when the uh, Alawite uh, defense formations collapse. I would not want to be a member of the Alawite defense formations when they collapse. Um, and I am very much afraid that other minorities, uh, said, like Christians, are, are going to get caught up in this. I would like to be wrong on this. Um, but, uh, you know, I spent a decade between Lebanon and Syria. Um, uh, that, that would be my fear. Yes, sir. My name is Xu Jiao from China Central Television. The question is about uh, due to the anti-U.S. protest in uh, erupted in Afghanistan. So, do you think it signals a kind of failure of Barack Obama's policies in the Middle East? Thank you so much. Yeah, the the protests. Brian, let me let me get to. Oh, sorry. No, no. Let me go behind, please. Here. Yep. And just wait for the microphone. Oh, thank you. Mr. Crocker, in your time in some of the uh, very troubled zones, you mentioned at the top of your remarks how it's about a risking of lives, not about pushing cookies and pinstripes. Do you think the situation in Libya, in retrospect, should have had more of a crossover between the diplom diplomatic end and the militaristic end? Uh, Paul Corson with CNN. Thank you. And that gentleman, please. Yes, sir. Bill Goodfellow, Center for International Policy. What are the prospects for, what are we doing to promote a political settlement? As distasteful as it might seem, I think some sort of deal with the Taliban has to be put in place or else the civil war is going to continue and even the good enough, Afghanistan good enough that you suggest, I, I just don't see it's possible. They're tenacious, they're, they're, they're not about to be defeated as long as they have Pakistan's backing. And I, I just think that much more emphasis has to be put on a, a political settlement. Uh, great, great questions all. Um, uh, we, we have seen, and I referred to them, um, uh, protests in Afghanistan before over uh, perceived affronts to Islam. Uh, you know, the, uh, what has just occurred doesn't really surprise me. Uh, and I think there's going to be uh, trouble in Pakistan, too. Uh, you know, there's kind of a fuse on these things. Um, um, uh, you know, Libya is a wild card because we still don't know that much about it. Hell, they don't know that much about it. Uh, uh, but but you get something pretty quick in Lebanon or Egypt. Uh, a little bit later in Syria, not this time. They got their hands full, um, uh, and then later still in um, in South Asia. So I think this is kind of following a, a, a progression. And I think in all of these, again, it's the Middle East, the broader Middle East. It's complicated. Uh, I think part of it is genuine outrage, as it is understood. Again, a lot of these people are illiterate. They, you know, they haven't seen a video. Um, they're not part of political cultures where governments don't actually make videos and authorize their release, but they are made and released. Uh, against the vehement opposition of the government in our case. But if they don't know us, they don't know that because that's not the way their world works. Uh, at the same time, I think, uh, as the Libyan government has alleged, investigation will have to uh, uh, bear it out. Uh, you, you create an environment where people are in the streets or ready to take to the streets. Uh, and then if you're part of... Um, uh, the really organized anti-U.S. element, you hijack it, or you put your elements in behind it, uh, you, you take Plan X off the shelf, and you use uh, a mob reaction to cover uh, uh, more specific attacks. Again, we'll have to sort it out. Uh, the Afghan thing doesn't look like that. Uh, uh, but I, 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 it's, it's, 
it's died down for the moment uh, in the Arab world. We may see a pickup uh, in, um, in, in South Asia. Uh, in, in Libya, again, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to see where a joint investigation leads us. Um, you know, I don't know at this point. Um, uh, I, I think implicit in my remarks is, boy, you know, be, be careful where you put your troops and to what end. Um, uh, and be, be beware of those unforeseen consequences. Um, uh, there was a lot of criticism at the time of the decision to um, use an air campaign uh, plus some some ground supply to unseat Gaddafi rather than boots on the ground. Well, you know, it worked. Um, you could still make the argument that, well, if we had boots on the ground, we would have been more able to determine political outcomes. Uh, uh, you know, my instinct is um, uh, no. Um, other than those, you know, the really few, uh, the very proud uh, Marines of our, our FAST teams uh, and our Marine security guards, um, I hope we reactivate the 4th uh, 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 Marine Expeditionary Battalion that came into being uh, after the East Africa attacks. It was, as some of you know, I mean, it was a counterterrorism unit in capital letters. Um, it isn't the size of forces. It's their uh, ability to carry out um, a counterterror protection mission, and uh, they are specifically trained for it. But I think that's as far as I would want to see a, a military uh, presence go in in, um, in Libya. There's been some discussion already, well, great, you got a fast team in now. Uh, too bad it wasn't in Benghazi uh, the day before Chris Stevens was. But again, hindsight is, is, uh, uh, is wonderful. Um, thank you for the question on reconciliation. Again, I touched on it but I was getting the evil stare from Ashley uh, 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 and Jessica. I mean, it was just it was mysterious. Um, uh, yeah, there does have to be a political settlement, but what it can't be, if it's going to be durable in, in the Afghan context, is a settlement between the U.S. and the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban will use that to uh, delegitimize an Afghan government. Uh, you know, our deal wasn't with these puppets. Our deal was with the puppet masters. Um, and it will actually, I, I think, uh, lessen the prospects for a stable outcome. Um, I think what we have to do, uh, as we were doing during my time, and I know we're doing now, is an intense, quiet set of discussions uh, with the Afghan government, you know, okay, who's um, who's maybe vulnerable? How can we work this? Who can we talk to? Who can do what? Uh, this is a very important topic for a serious discussion trilaterally, as you point out. Pakistanis play a major role here, and as uh, they have now learned, a lot of those guys they have been giving safe harbor to happen to have links to guys who are killing their guys. Uh, so we got something to talk about. That, that needs to be part of it. Uh, because I think you're right, you are not going to get, if you ever can, a reasonably comprehensive settlement uh, between the Taliban and the Afghan government without full cooperation from Pakistan, which has its own sets of concerns that need to be addressed. Um, so again, I've said this about 20,000 times, I'd say it 20,000 more, it's really complicated. Uh, that, that's not to say there is not a direct role for us. Um, uh, you know, I like meeting with bad guys. I mean, it's kind of fun. Uh, um, so at Afghan government request, I did meet with a number of uh, representatives of militant groups who were able to get to Afghanistan and enjoy Afghan protection when they were there. I never asked how they got there. I didn't want to know. Um, 
but, you know, at certain times, the Afghan government judged it efficacious to have the American ambassador sit down with, again, I won't denominate, oh, well, hell, it's been in the press, I mean, with the Hikmatyar group, um, you know, with the, uh, the Quetta Taliban, with others. Uh, does it move them? Um, you know, we'll find out. We, we do have to be fully engaged on this, but it's got to be in support of the Afghans because uh, otherwise all you do is add uh, uh, a new element of instability and a new element of um, threat rather than um, support for an Afghan government that has its hands full. Thank you very much. Um, Molly Williamson, American Academy of Diplomacy. Thank you for your service. Welcome home. Um, my question is in the realm of unintended consequences, but perhaps a foreseeable consequences. This town is raging in debate about uh, escalating uh, a conflict with Iran. Um, it's done in the cloud, of course, of uh, campaign uh, spirit. Um, what risks do you see to our interests throughout the region should uh, escalation continue? Uh, Why would you call on her? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Molly, uh, thank you for, for your service. Uh, we've uh, played tag team through all the worst places in the world for about three decades. Um, you know, there's, there's one thing worse than an Iran with nuclear arms. Um, and that is an Iran with nuclear arms that somebody tried to prevent from obtaining them by military force. Um, you know, the Iranians have had more than three decades to contemplate what happened at Osirak uh, in June 81, uh, when the Israelis uh, took out uh, the Iraqi nuclear reactor. Uh, so they've got three decades plus uh, in which to figure out how to render a nuclear weapons capability um, virtually invulnerable uh, in its totality to an air or air mobile assault. Um, I don't know what they got. Uh, uh, I'd like to think somebody in the government knows what they got, but uh, hey, we thought the Iraqis had WMD. Um, uh, but what they got is designed to, to survive in its essence. I mean, they may lose, lose an awful lot of peripherals, but in its essence, um, that their nuclear program will be able to come through whatever we and the Israelis can throw at, at it short of an army of occupation. Uh, and if anybody thinks that's a good idea, uh, you know, must have missed the chapter on Iraq. Um, uh, you know, a very senior Israeli official told me, because this is, again, old debate, um, uh, uh, as you look at the Iraq nuclear challenge, there are two bad choices, and they both begin with A, attack and appeasement. Uh, and his recommendation is that we do exactly what we've been doing through two administrations with international support of varying strengths, uh, which is you keep the political pressure on, you keep the economic pressure on, you keep going back for tighter and tighter sanctions. Uh, you do what you can to make uh, the people feel the pain. You start uh, or fuel a debate within Iran about just how smart is this anyway? Uh, you know, look what's happening to the quality of our education, our health care, our economic opportunity. Um, uh, and you gradually but steadily raise the price uh, to achieve a nuclear weapons capability while making it clear uh, that should they, you know, continue on that course, um, uh, some really unpleasant things are going to happen. Um, uh, 
that their own people may hold them accountable for if we do our public diplomacy right. So I, I think that's about uh, where I would have it, at least until after November 6th. It's, uh, <laughs> Particularly for your candor, because there's always the temptation to be confronted with difficult questions that have great political impact to make a presentation like the State Department spokesperson. It's wonderful that you're liberated from that constraint uh, and that you spoke to us in a range of issues, not just on the substance, but also bringing into them your own contribution and your own experience. Uh, so thank you very much. And I also want to thank you before we leave. I also want to thank you before, before we leave for your national service to this country. And I want to wish you all the very best in 